Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the worship service today. Thank you for the great things you've done in our lives. And thank you, Lord, because we are here today still alive. And we know that all the good things you want to do in our lives, before we leave this world, you are going to accomplish everything. And we pray, Lord, you keep us on the path that you have ordained for us. So that, Lord, every good intention you have, every good plan you have, for every one brother, sister, young and old, you will fulfill in Jesus' name. Speak to our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Today we're coming to Hebrews chapter 13. And we're looking at verse 4. Hebrews chapter 13. We're looking at verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But all mongers and adulterers, God will judge. Here the writer of the Hebrews tell, tells us about the sacred thing that is called marriage. That leads to the family, sacred marriage, godly family. And he tells us that this marriage is honorable in all. Going back to history. Going back to the time of the creation of man, Adam and Eve. Even though Adam had everything. Everything spiritual. Everything natural. Everything physical. Everything social. Everything around and within. Yet marriage was necessary for him. And as we look at the people of God since that time, until this time, the Lord is still saying for every man, for every tribe, in every nation, and for every generation, for every particular persuasion, whatever religious uh, circle in which we might find ourselves, it says marriage is honorable in all. And it is this honorable marriage or sacred marriage that actually keeps the bed undefiled. And it says that the provision of marriage and provision of the family, the one that becomes an adulterer, a fornicator, an unclean person, will be judged by the Lord. We're looking at this and we're looking at what the Lord is saying to the church today. And what the Lord is saying to every child of God here today. As we look at this, it says in verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Is talking to the brethren, he's talking to the people who are saved. Actually, as you go back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, you'll see the very foundation of our lives and the very foundation of the provision of God for us. It tells us in chapter 2, verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? It tells us the very thing we need to start life with and to live the life that is pleasing to the Lord and the life that is going to be a great blessing to you to meet our neighbors is this great salvation how shall we escape how shall we escape mystery in life suffering in life how shall we escape tragedy in life how do we escape perdition and punishment in eternity if we neglect so great salvation what kind of salvation is salvation new there are some people that think salvation is only a new idea, a new philosophy, a new kind of message, a new doctrine in the churches that are living today. They talk about evangelical church, they talk about historic church, they talk about Pentecostal churches, and they think that it's these new churches that talk about the salvation. Look at what it says. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed? Burned unto us by them that heard him. It didn't be begin with us, it began with the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, it dates back to the Old Testament, this salvation that Jesus recognized that all have seen and come short of the glory of God. And that we cannot save ourselves. Whatever you do, whatever life you live, whatever works of righteousness. Feel the right. You try to manifest. He says all these cannot save. That's why Jesus Christ came to the cross of Calvary to die for you and to die for me. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And as you believe on that Lord Jesus Christ, you confess your sin, you turn away from that sin, you say, I accept you, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. 
that great, glorious, wonderful salvation becomes yours. It was spoken by the Lord and is confirmed unto us by those that had him. That's what makes you a brother. That's what makes you a sister. That's what makes you to have the grace of God. And you cannot understand, neither can you do what we are talking about today in the proper way. There is honorable marriage and there is sacred marriage and there is godly family. You cannot do that except this grace or salvation has come to you and you become a brother in Christ and you are keeping to that very fact that you are a real child of God. Look at chapter 3 verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. It is this heavenly calling, heavenly conversion, heavenly grace coming upon our lives that makes us to be the people that are candidates for a sacred marriage and then a godly family. Holy brethren, you search, partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. He is the high priest, he is the one that shed the blood for us, and he is the one that presents the sacrifice of his own blood before the throne of God. And he says, because of my blood, Father, forgive them. Because of my blood, Father, convert them. Because of my, of my blood, Father, give them a place in the kingdom. Look at verse 6. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. It's not just that you are com commencing, beginning the Christian life, you continue day by day, day after day, in the grace of God. It is that continuation, that continuity that brings you to the very climax now that we can say, by the grace of God through you and through your wife or through your husband, you can make a secret marriage and then a godly family was for him for him. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence, steadfast unto the edge. The faith that brought us into the kingdom will remain in that faith and will remain in that trust and confidence and will remain firm to the very end. Not going back to sin, not going back to our vomit, not going back to the evil things we left behind. What we have been purged from, purified from, that we are kept clean and kept righteous and kept pure by the blood of the Lamb and by the grace of God that comes in our lives. Then in chapter 4 he tells us that we will continue. In that grace, by helping, by receiving help from above every time. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Now you are born again. You have not neglected so great salvation. You have received the so great salvation. And the beauty of salvation is being worked out in your life by that grace. And it says, you'll need that grace every day. Temptations will come, trials will come. Opposition will come, persecution will come, and then you come boldly, confidently, with faith unto that throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And he always reminds you it is Jesus Christ who has saved us by his suffering, by what he did. Look at chapter 5, verse 9. He tells us, and we made perfect. He became the author of what kind of salvation? eternal salvation unto them all them that obey him he gives you the grace to obey and the grace to live in righteousness and godliness all the days of your life and that is how you have that salvation and we're told this great salvation in chapter 2 now it tells us it's eternal salvation in here in chapter 5 look at chapter 7 that he's able to keep us after you, after you are born again, after you become a child of God. And you're not the person that says, I don't know whether I can stand or not. I don't know whether I can remain in Christ or not. Chapter 7 verse 25. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost. Able to save them to the uttermost. Whatever your background, whatever your circumstances, able to save them to the uttermost. Whatever the peculiarity of the society you are living in, able to save them to the uttermost. Whatever the trials or temptation of the devil coming against you, able to save them to the uttermost. Whether you are single or you are married, whether you are having children or you are still to have children, is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing 
he ever lived to make intercession for them. He says he's making intercession for us as how, and that is why we have this great salvation. And the great salvation is working in our lives. And is able to keep us victorious all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. He calls it salvation. He also calls it redemption. Look at chapter 9. Chapter 9 verse 12. Chapter 9 verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered into, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained, what, what did he obtain? eternal everlasting redemption for us that means has redeemed us from all our sin he's taking all the sins away the punishment of sin is taken away that's the meaning of salvation you've turned away from your sin and you turn to the lord jesus christ as your savior and that savior saves you from all your sin and he says it is forgiveness it is redemption and it is not a temporary redemption it's not a temporary salvation eternal salvation and then eternal redemption for us verse 14 how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without sport to god put your conscience from dead works to serve the living god it makes us to be able to serve the living God now that we are born again. We are talking about marriage, but we need to lay this foundation. That it is the grace of God coming to your life at the point of salvation. And then remaining in your life as you are steadfast in the Lord. That makes you to be able to actually fulfill the will of God, the word of God. As it gives us the details in the Bible concerning the sacred marriage and the godly family. In chapter 10 verse 19. Having therefore brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. It tells us when you are born again, you are holy. And then you become sanctified, you are holier. And it says you are not even stopping there. You want to enter the holiest of experiences in the very presence of the Lord. You love that holiness, you delight in that holiness, you rejoice in that holiness. And day by day, as you get in the presence of God, as day by day, as you experience that awesome presence of the Lord, that empowering presence of the Lord, and it says you are entering into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh and have been an high priest over the house of god he says let us draw near with a true heart your heart has been cleansed and purged and purified and washed in the blood of the lamb he's giving you a new heart and because of that new heart you know live a new life and he says don't forget we're drawing nearer and nearer unto god every time let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promise you'll find the faithfulness of god really your life in jesus name and then as a result of that he says anything trying to come into your life your personal life your family life your professional life that is not according to the will of god because you're getting nearer and nearer to the lord and you want your life and your marriage in particular now your family in particular now to be according to the will of god there may be things that will be kicking off and shedding off and throwing off away from your life chapter 12 verse 1 wherefore see we also are compassed about we're so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight. And, you know, as we're talking about the sacred marriage and then the godly family, and there are people that they started well when they first got married, husband and wife, brother and sister, how sacred that was, how godly that was, how gracious that was. But, you know, day by day, some things began to creep into their lives. Some things began to creep into their families and they didn't understand it's not a big thing we're talking about it may be just a little thing little thing there little drops of water make a mighty ocean 
and those little little things they're not taken care of and that's why because what was sacred before became defiled what was godly before became ungodly but it says wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us and you'll find sometimes you know when you wash in the morning if you wash in the place the water coming over your body can get you a place you can see because it's set so dirty and then you're wondering oh yesterday i took my bath and i didn't go to the mud to roll myself in the mud why is this that's the reason you're washing every day what if a person says that i feel clean i feel all right there's nothing to wash and therefore the first day you know didn't take his bath and second day didn't take his bath i didn't roll on the ground i didn't you know sleep on the ground i think i am clean you find after one week something is happening that we're saying you ought to wash something away because now the odor of the stench is unbearable you know in the family it might be that you say well we're not committing that sin and that sin we're happily married together you need to be renewing that covenant every day and covenant and renewing that relationship every day and then you are checking up every day the heavy weight that may come in the family and the misunderstanding that may come in the family and the little little things that come if you are going to the cross and going to Calvary every time renewing your covenant every day that sacredness of your marriage will be preserved in Jesus name and the godliness and the graciousness in your marriage will be preserved in Jesus name and then it says in verse 14 it says follow peace with all men and in reference to your marriage follow peace with your husband follow peace with your wife and follow peace with your prince and follow peace with your children and holiness without which no man shall see the lord holiness in the family holiness between husband and wife holiness between parents and children holiness between the maids and the people that are there holiness without which no man shall see the lord that brings us now to verse 30, chapter 13 verse 1 let brotherly love continue it says we have started we started with salvation the basis of our relationship is salvation and the basis of the sacred marriage is salvation and the basis of the godly family is salvation it says let it continue let brotherly love continue the kind of love we have in the marriage that makes the marriage work it's not, you know, the kind of love they have in the world. It's brotherly love, it's sacred love, it's godly love, it's heavenly love. And now it says in verse 4, marriage is honorable in all. Make your marriage honorable. Don't make it dishonorable. And then it says on the bed undefiled. And then it says if there is any fornication, any uncleanness, any defilement, any adultery, the all mongers and the adulterers, what will happen? Tell me out loud. God will judge. Always be conscious of God. Don't be conscious of the church more than God. Don't be conscious of a leader more than God. And you know, there are some things some people do and they will say, once the church does not know, then I'm all right. No, you are not all right. God will judge. There are many people that church cannot judge because church does not say anything wrong. There are many people that a leader, a pastor cannot judge because leader or pastor does not say anything wrong. But God can see. He sees our hearts. He sees our lives. And He sees us everywhere we are, where men cannot see us. All mongers and adulterers, God will judge. We're talking about the sacredness of godly marriage and family. The sacredness of godly marriage and family. Three points to look at. Number one, God's justification for marriage without adultery god's justification for marriage without adultery number two god's judgment he gives